Thanks to Tiffany Fong for recording this interview. Her channel in the description below. Uh, so yeah, I, I have a couple questions. Read the margin accounts. I mean, um, there's sort of all this talk about the terms of service. Did you break terms of service? Did you not? You're basically claiming that there was a separate side of your terms of service, which said that uh, if people had margin accounts, you could use kind of their funds or there was looser language around that. But I talked to somebody from Alameda and asked how big the position of like or how many people had assets in the type of accounts that that terms of service would apply to versus the regular terms of service, which said you couldn't use their money. And they said it was about a billion that was in the margin trading or the, the margin like um, side of things where you could reuse their funds or whatever. And there was the rest of it was not there. So does that mean the rest of the money was stolen? I mean, like. It seems like you're putting all your eggs behind this one excuse about, you know, there was this separate side of the terms of service. How do you address everyone else? So I don't have all the data in front of me. My memory is that it was substantially more than a billion um, in the margin trading program. Um, but I don't have that data in front of me right now. So I can't verify that. Um, on top of that, there were other effects as well. Um, and I don't have the data about all the details of those in front of me, but my understanding is that, um, you know, some of those were, uh, you know, uh, early uh, wire transfers sent directly to Alameda, which I think contributed to the position as well. Um, and then there are open futures positions on top of that, you know, on top of the spot margin positions um, where, uh, you know, there can be effectively socialized, uh, you know, losses, clawbacks if, you know, one is unable to be closed um, uh, in time. And so I think it was a combination of those factors. Um, uh, there may have been other factors, too, but that's what I've been, you know, able to, to piece together. Um, and that, you know, putting those together, I think is, is, is likely how you got. Um, to most of this, but, um, I, uh, but, but again, here, here's the thing. How do, how do you account for maybe the difference in what people are hearing from insiders, uh, who are not being accused of fraud and you who sort of is, there's a very different sort of story going on here where you, you know, you're saying like, oh, there's this big p position that we didn't know about because you told me that the last time we spoke in a space and I went and followed up and I said, Hey, is this true? Could it be that this, uh, you know, number just wasn't known about? And some Alameda insider said, no way. You could see on dashboards really simply where it was. And FTX dashboards, not Alameda dashboards, dashboards that you yourself had access to. So my question is sort of like, it seems like when I go to Alameda insiders or FTX insiders, they're saying this story makes no sense. But when I go to you, who sort of has every incentive to sort of lie and obfuscate, um, because obviously the incentive here is, well, otherwise you might go to jail, uh, which obviously would be a very bad thing for you. It seems like all of a sudden all the excuses come out. And then when we follow up on them, they don't seem to be true. So I, I, I don't know, like, help me square this because, you know, it'd be nice if you were telling the truth, but everything we're hearing from insiders is that you're not. I don't know what to tell you. I'm saying what I believe. I don't know which insiders you're talking about. I don't know exactly what they said. It doesn't line up with my beliefs, but I can't speak to what they think or what they said. But why sorry, are multiple people more, within but... your company at less senior roles knowing more about the company than you? And Alamy was not a company that is running at the time, but I hear you. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know exactly what you're referring to. I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know what they said. Um, I don't Well, I'm telling you what some of what they said. I mean, for example, uh, one of them I was know. that there was like that like that backdoor system or whatever, A, that you knew it existed, and B, that it was easy to see the balance or the the position of Alameda very simply on FTX dashboards. Because uh, they had a they had a margin trading account with you guys. So you guys could have seen it. But you uh, guys could see the margin positions of but, everybody, no? But a lot of the position did not appear in that main account. So where was the position? It was in a separate stub account, I believe, related to wire transfers that had been sent, you know, to Alameda Research, uh, generally primarily to FTX, um, having its own bank accounts. 
So who controlled the secret stub account? I. Did I'm, anyone at Alameda know about this secret stub account? I mean, are, are we supposed to believe that just like there was this stub account that nobody knew about? I don't know who knew about what when. I'm sorry. I mean, clearly somebody lost the money, right? Like, obviously, the money went somewhere. Somebody lost it. It just seems really convenient that $8 billion was located in this, like, account that didn't show up when you pulled up Alameda's balances, right? Yeah. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, okay, so a separate question is obviously around this Forbes thing because you've said you don't have you don't have present knowledge of sort of like Alameda's balances, and they came out and said that you were giving them up to date balances from Alameda. How do you square that? Just as of a month ago, you knew um, Alameda's position. How does I've that given, square with your statement about like you don't know what's going on? I haven't seen the the thing that you're referring to, but. I was able to give very rough approximations that included a subset of the list of assets that Alameda had. Um, I, by asking about the assets I believe to be the largest sets of them, um, I was not giving you know full accountings um, I, of all of Alameda's balances or positions um, because I you know didn't generally have those and because it was, it was a complicated process depended on liquidity of tokens and things like that from the Ford's perspective. So I was just sending them a sort of abbreviated partial list of Alameda assets periodically. But that means you knew that what, what Alameda had. Even roughly, you knew what Alameda had. I had a rough sense of what their assets are. That is correct. Um, by rough, I, I do mean to within you know $10 billion or so. Um, I did not have a fine grained sense of what their asset total asset value was. And I did not have a fine grained sense of their liabilities or of their margin position size or how that was split up. I guess one of my questions is like, what do you think should be done if we find out that you're lying about all of this? Like sort of, cause it's kind of one thing to, to steal people's money. It's another thing to lie about it. What do you think should be done? Like, cause I, I mean, it's going to be, obviously a lot of this is going to eventually get litigated uh, you know, eventually Caroline Ellison's going to have to take the stand. What happens if she pulls out text messages that shows you knew about it? I mean, do you think that wipes away your credibility? I mean, I think a lot of my credibility has already been wiped away, frankly. And I think that's uh, honestly, that's not what I'm thinking about right now. I'm not trying to focus on, you know, my, like, I, I'm just thinking about, like, customers or who I think are, are, are what matter. So you're saying there's a chance for them to get money back or for us to get our money back? I don't want to speak out of turn and I I can't make promises on behalf of the company. I can't speak on behalf of the company. Um, and I don't know what decisions everyone's going to make. Um, I do know that FTX US, to my knowledge, is totally solvent and could, I think, um, return everyone's money tomorrow if it wanted to. Um, and I think internationally, uh, you know, there are a lot of pathways, you know, potentially forward there that one could imagine um, FTX International taking. I think, you know, I know that as of before I filed, um, there were billions of dollars of like serious funding uh, offers potentially on the table. And, um, you know, I would, I would uh, expect and hope that those are being deeply. Who are those funding offers? I, uh, I don't know that I have uh, authority to. Uh, say well, you said you had four billion dollars, like yep. that came in, right? Yep. Is, is that still? Does that still exist? Was that ever real? I. Uh, I think it, uh, I mean, I think it, I, I don't know for sure, but um, I think that some of those might. Um, it, I, uh, I, my guess is that, that some of them might, that, and um, I, you know, I, I hope that the sort of relevant teams are doing whatever they can to maximize value for customers here. Yeah, it just kind of doesn't make a lot of sense why someone would pour $4 billion when you guys have liabilities 
sort of as high as you do. Um, can you talk a bit about the marked um, the marked market like? statements you were making around solvency you're making some pretty outrageous statements about like ftx you know ha had the money when a lot of it was serum ftt these tokens that you know you can't sell in those amounts and you know that would completely crash the price that can't support that kind of selling um were you kind of deliberately misleading people there so i what i can say is i was just thinking about them in terms of well uh, you know, in terms their mark price was just whatever their market price was at the time. And, you know, obviously I was cognizant of the fact that, um, uh, that, you know, you can't, the, the, the market price isn't necessarily, I mean, is, is never, you know, what you could sell a large amount of, of something for, but I also massively misjudged that discrepancy there. And, um, uh, what what do you mean you massively misjudged it? Because you knew sort of roughly the percentage of of serum and FTT you held, and you knew the the trading volume. I mean, you are a smart guy. You're a professional trader. You know, there's no way you make a simple mistake like that, right? Like, how, how how's that even possible? I mean, it was a pretty big misjudgment and mistake that I made. Um, and a pretty embarrassing one, but I was thinking of it internally in the context of standard market environment. And obviously that still means, you know, substantial impact, but, uh, but it's a different scale than what you would see, um, than what we did see in the market crash that happened where, um, without selling, uh, you know, without liquidating the position, there was a, you know, much larger than than fifty percent market crash in a few day period, um, with you know, uh, very little bid side liquidity, and uh, it, you know that obviously history has said again and again that those events are possible. Those very correlated market crashes, and not just very correlated market but crashes in those instruments, but ones where hedges don't end up working fully. Or even right, but we all, don't basically. we don't even need to to have this market crash for the statement about mark to market uh, accounting making no sense, right? And you just said that yourself. Even with with standard movements, right? If you tried to sell the amount of serum or FTT that you had on the books, you wouldn't have gotten half. You wouldn't have gotten a quarter of what you put on your books to investors. And so the question is, is like we know that you're not. The, the problem is, is like every time it comes to this hard point. The answer seems to always be, I made an embarrassing mistake. But at what point are you going to say like, no, I'm a smart guy, right? You were, you were at the highest levels of this entire industry. You were the guy to go to, the smartest guy in the room, right? It's hard to believe that you made this many embarrassing mistakes. One embarrassing mistake, I get it. But you're just, everything's an embarrassing mistake. At least tell us that you knew that the mark to market made no sense. And the way that I was thinking about risk at score was starting with mark to market and then adjusting down effectively from that. Um, and uh, and obviously that means that there should be a real buffer because of exactly what you're saying. That buffer should have been a lot larger than I was thinking. But of. but you never you never you never went you never went down from risk from there. And you said publicly you said FTX is solvent. Other views may differ. Well, there is no other view on it. There's the fact of how markets work and you were making public misleading statements. It wasn't one time you did this. You continue to make misleading statements about it after people have, had given you pushback. So sorry, which which time are you talking about here? I think it was in one of your follow ups about the what happened. You uh, you said something about other views may differ. Oh, that was FTX US, was it not? I'm going to look it up real quick. Um, I'll follow up. In the meantime, uh, Cash22, you have a question? I got a quick question about um, Dan Friedberg, your chief regulatory officer. This is a guy. Uh, so, I, so obviously, gonna, once. I, 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 I don't feel comfortable like talking about other people without getting, you know, sort of their sign off on that. So I, I think there's a limited extent to which I'm going to be willing 
uh, or, or feel comfortable, um, you know, speaking on others' behalves. No, that's totally fair. And I don't want you to speak on his behalf, obviously. I want you to get, share your perspective, your unique perspective on the situation. Um, just like the same, I might ask a question about Caroline Ellison, but I only could expect right. your position on the uh, situation. So kind of the, um, the, the situation there is obviously this is sort of a tale of two stories about how FTX failed. One is like a lack of regulation, a lack of clarity, a, the kind of just this thing that accumulated over time. The other one is, of course, a story of fraud. Of course, we have to look at who were the adults in the room. One of the adults, obviously, was Dan Friedberg, chief regulatory officer. Um, I'm sure you're aware he was behind the um, ultimate bet scandal where he gave players God mode in a poker game where people could see um, the hands. And he actually like basically conspired with Russ Hamilton to hide that. So does that suggest something about your intention that you hired a guy that basically one of his biggest achievements was hiding fraud. Um, can you explain sort of your thinking? I know you don't want to talk about him. Can you explain your thinking about why this would be the guy you choose as the chief regulatory officer? Um, I, we had a number of people uh, in the legal department. Uh, we had, that was, you know, maybe our fastest growing department. Um, we had a number of outside law firms as well. You know, Dan was obviously one of the people who had been, you know, working, uh, you know, for FTX for a while. He was, yeah, he's the chief guy. He should have caught some of this stuff, you'd think, in theory. Well, when you say he's the chief guy, I mean, there's, you know, we also had general counsels. We had, we had other positions as well. But, um, I, but I, you know, I, I can't speak to what, other people's you know views were what they thought or knew or or intending when um but i uh, you know i know that like our our you know legal and regulatory team had an enormous task in front of them we were looking to get you know licensed and regulated in dozens of jurisdictions at once we did end up doing that that was an unbelievably large undertaking which i think you know took up most of the time of you know most of our legal and compliance departments and you know in retrospect i think you know probably took up too much time um uh but at the end of the day i was ceo and that means that at the end of the day it's on me to make sure that we have people who are in charge of you know all of the important things and i did that for some of the areas i failed to do that for others and but why'd you choose him specifically? I mean, obviously, you could have chosen a lot of different lawyers to go with. Um, and I understand you had multiple lawyers. But if this is if this story of FTX is largely a failure of regulation, a failure of uh, controls at an organization and your chief regulatory officer is Dan Friedberg, the question is, well, maybe this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't put a guy like this in front of this. I'm not obviously saying it's his fault solely, but I'm just asking sort of what was the thinking behind putting this guy in charge? Because it seems like you couldn't pick a less qualified candidate if you want to get actual regulation in the room. I'm pretty, con I, I didn't say this was a failure of regulation. And we did an enormous amount of work on you know, getting licensed and regulated, we're licensed in more jurisdictions than I think any other exchange was. Um, I think it was absolutely a failure of oversight of risk management. Um, um, but I, I, but, you know, I, I, and I think that, you know, in retrospect, I would have viewed the core duties and things I, I need to make sure of more so than anything else very differently than I did. Um, but uh, but from a you know becoming licensed perspective, uh, we did do quite a bit there and were um, able to accomplish that in you know in a fairly short period of time. And so I, I think I'm not sure that I completely agree with the premise of um, of that framing of the question. And you know I'll just say that like the people who work with FTX like. I have enormous respect for uh, most of them and they, you know, did enormously valuable work and, um, you know, they didn't do all the work. Obviously there are really important things that didn't get done. Um, but that's on me as CEO 
to make sure that there are people who are doing all of the important things because there's way too much to do. We're doing way too much as a company for um, you know any particular person to be expected to be definitely on top of even of some important things, um, given how many other important things they also had to be dealing with at the time. Um, so, and by the way, I do apologize. I do, I am fairly late at this point. For next thing, I do have to, to hop off. Sam, thank you so much uh, for your time and CoffeeZilla and other you know, speakers. Thank you so much, Marty. Everybody, thank you so much for your questions.